Yeah, hello. We had technical problems. We are talking from the Museum of Democracy, El Museo de la Democracia, which is hosted until tomorrow at the new Association for Visual Arts in Berlin, NGBK. And I have the pleasure to be here with our guests, Maria Teresa Alves, who's speaking with us from Sicily, in, from uh, Napoli, in Italy. Uh, Marcela Moraga, who a Chilean artist based in Berlin since many years ago and who has been working with the Community Museum of Water in the locality of Ranaico in the south of Chile. Also, Maria Teresa has been developing a work for years with the Community Museum of the Chico Valley outside Mexico City uh, with uh, preserving and, and, and diffusing the cultural and social life and history of a displaced community uh, in, the, um, in the locality of Chico. And uh, Julia Mensch, an artist from Argentina who's based in Berlin, as every one of us, and she has studied in Argentina and at the UDK in Berlin at the chair of the German artist Hito Steyer. And she has been developing a strain of her work uh, relating to the Museum of Hunger, El Museo del Hambre, in the capital city of Argentina, Buenos Aires. I, I would say it would be a pleasure to hear you present your life and work related to community museums in Latin America. Let's say I would begin with uh, uh, Julia, who's okay. present here with mm -hmm. me. And thank you so much for coming and also for collaborating with this fictive institution hosted at the Association for Visual Arts mm -hmm. called Museum of Democracy. We kind of work also with the idea of a community museum, uh, connecting several communities in the region in a, in a collection whose goal, which goal is to preserve in a fictive future the goods and knowledge just related to democracy, but you are working with another issue, which is hunger as itself, and a, a very interesting concept you told us about, namely the uh, nutritional sovereignty. Food sovereignty. Food sovereignty. Una soberanía de la alimentación, de la comida. Muchas gracias. Could you please tell us a little bit more about what is this Museum of Hunger? How you, do you relate your work to it? And yeah. Okay, maybe I first explain a little bit from, from where comes this uh, collaboration with the Hunger Museum. Um, so I'm from Buenos Aires, as I say, uh, as Theo was saying, uh, but I live uh, like part in Buenos Aires, part in Berlin. And in 2017, I was in Buenos Aires, living there and developing a research which is called Cartography of an Experiment Under Open Sky. Um, and because of this research, I got to know the museum, or El Museo del Hambre. Uh, my research is about uh, the implementation of the monoculture model in Argentina, uh, which started in 1996 with the, uh, uh, with the approve of the first uh, genetically modified crop uh, for commercialization, which, which was the Rotam Ready Glyphosate Tolerant Soybeans from Monsanto Bayer. Today, Monsanto Bayer, at that time, only Monsanto. Um, do you hear me well? Okay. Yes. Sorry, it's not clear if the audio is working that well for me, or it was. Okay, like, I got to know the, the museum because I was doing this research, uh, which is on one hand, working with the implementation of the model, which I was explaining, but also working with the alternatives and resistance to this uh, ecocide, which is taking place in Latin America. Argentina was the first country to open the doors to transgenic agriculture, and this changed the whole scenario of uh, agriculture itself in the country, but also bring many, many environmental problems and also health problems for uh, uh, human and non-human beings, and, and this changed the whole region. Argentina was the first one, but afterwards came Brazil and, and the whole region itself. And, 
And I started to develop this research from my position as artist because I was a bit tired of like, being told I'm not, I'm not able to, to criticize this model because I'm not a scientist myself or I'm not an <laughs> agronomist. And that's why I started this, uh, this research. And maybe I can, oh, I, I can share one image. Let's see if it's okay. Now you see it, what I'm sharing, or no? Yes. Yeah, yes. good. Um, the format of the work is like a collection of, I will say, portraits. Um, I'm doing portraits of people, plants, and genetically modified uh, plants, and doing a huge research. And when I say huge, it's because I didn't, de I was always working with research, but never so much until this project. Like in one point I was being myself like in a weird position, being like a journalist, not a, as an artist anymore somehow. Because the, there is so much going on and what I was doing was like to do, to visit def different territories in the country and, and doing interviews to farmers, but also to teachers, to um, scientists, to different people who are fighting against this model and besides, I was of course reading a lot of fiction, but uh, mainly theory. And these portraits like, are not only of the people building this resistance and alternatives, like the one constructing the Hunger Museum, but also to the responsibles of the implementation of this model. And, this, and, and my wish, uh, because it's my wish somehow to make them visible. So I visited the, the Hunger Museum for first time in 2017 when it was open. I got to know it, uh, yeah, like one Friday because they do every Friday one open evening, inviting people to present different kinds of works. It's all around food sovereignty, which uh, was already Theo saying. And, and I have to maybe say, which is behind the Hunger Museum, there is one person, one lawyer, uh, a lawyer um, specialized in human rights and food sovereignty who in the cellar of the, his mother house <laughs> built a, a huge place which is not so huge but it's a huge meeting place like it's, it's a museum which is hosting from political meetings to yoga classes to like when the she 20 was taking place it was a place where the the demonstration was being organized or, but which is really nice is this kind of meeting point, which is always super long. It start with this lecture, a film screening, exhibition or whatever, and end with a meal that we all share. And uh, it's a meal which is in, in words of Marco Filardi, this lawyer, sana, segura y soberana, so healthy, safe, and sovereign dinner. And maybe I, I, I will co quote him saying why. You tell me if I should, I continue or, or I, sure. I leave this for yes, later? Yes, just do. Good. Um, he say healthy is because it's free in harmless substances. So GMO, pesticides, antibiotics, uh, chemical additives, and so on, safe, is because we know and we trust in who produced this, this meal, and sovereign is that it is produced and distributed with the criteria of food sovereignty, agroecology, lo localization, direct approach of producers and consumers, centrality of uh, family, farmers and indigenous agriculture, and social and popular economy. So in the, in the Hunger Museum, you are also able to get your, your huge amount of vegetables every week coming from a cooperative as well. So this is kind of what the Hunger Museum is about. Could you... Stop, yeah. Um, could you tell us a, a little bit, uh, we still have like a couple of minutes, a little bit more about uh, who can be a member of this Museum of Hunger? Yeah, somehow everybody can be a member. So it's a really open space and as I say, it's a, I mean, for me, I was going at the beginning as a, 
as a visitor to, to listen all these talks that were taking place there. But somehow later on is a meeting place, and, and which is interesting or for me doing like as, a, as an artist, a practice there inside of the museum, doing an exhibition, organizing things with them, was for me interesting to, to try to bring the, the art public or the art uh, scene more than public to the museum itself, because in a way, you can meet in the museum many people who are already working on the subject. And, and the idea is that like, everyone who organizes something there are bringing new people. And the idea, like the museum is a, is a center of fight for food sovereignty with all what this means in the context I was describing, no? the monoculture model being applied for more than 20 years. And which is really important is like, like the, the, the transgenic soy was approved in 1996, as I say, and the, the term uh, food sovereignty was also created in exactly this year by Via Campesina in Rome in one international forum for, for, for food. I had a World Food Summit yeah, in Rome, exactly, where 185 five um, countries were being part and there it was when this concept was created and, and spread in different countries and, and was changing meaning or and not changing meaning but adding maybe more meaning. So in the same year these two different ways somehow were created. In 1996 yeah. it was. And, okay, so let's go now to a short presentation by Marcela who's mm -hmm. right next to me. Maybe okay. Marcela, uh, who, has, who is an artist from Chile and who has also studied in Germany and um, has been developing a, a, a work with the community museum, with the water community museum of uh, the community of Renaico in southern Chile. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the work you developed there. I, I understand mm -hmm. it was developed, developed during a residency, a research residency. Mm -hmm in which you were supposed or you intended to generate like community work with the, with the community which is menaced by the industry of uh, cellulose or the, the, the wood industry, the paper industry in the region. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about this museum that is being formed and was initiated partly by you and your will to create mm -hmm. and work there. Yes. Yes, I will uh, show you some images and I will um, show you also where is located this uh, museum. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, so, okay. Um, okay, the, the name of this town is Renaico. Renaico is located in, in the south of Chile and Renaico is not only the name of this town, it's also the name of a river. So uh, it was really uh, interesting for me to know that um, the word Renaico comes from Renaico in Mapudungun, the language of Mapuche people, and Renaico means a place where a lot of water springs from the soil. And this area is, um, is home to the largest forest industry in the country. And this causes a lot of uh, drought pollution in several rivers and also has ignited a violent social conflict between Chilean state and Mapuche communities in this area. And because of the industry, the water level of the Renaico River has been falling continuously for about 15 years. So you see in these images um, the pines and eucalyptus monoculture plantations and there is a lot, a lot. Uh, this is really terrible at the south of Chile. And between these plantations uh, are living the people. 
and also are the two big plants of forest uh, industry. So for um, production of paper, cellulose, and other stuff. And the problem is that these trees, they need a lot of water. Um, but also the industry for the, all the production, they need also a lot of water. And during the summer, for example, there is also the problem that uh, these, these uh, trees uh, produce also fires. And, and as you see, the earth, is all, uh, I mean the soil, is, is also really eroded. It's a lot of erosion. So it is a lot of reasons that the, the river is, uh, the water level of the river is, is really down. And, and yes, I, I, um, I got um, a stipendium art from a project for a collaborator for communities project. And in Chile, it was a, a scholarship a stipendium from Chile. And I was uh, living there during three months. And there I met this youth collective, uh, Salvemos el Rio Renaico. There, there are a young, young collective people, um, 20 years old. And it was incredible, a group of people, because they, they make a newspaper on internet, they carry out also environmental workshops for children, and a lot of activities like cultural festivals, concerts, and, and they are really worried about the problem of the river. And when we meet, um, they tell me a lot about the river and the, the problem also that the, the people in Renaico, they don't, they don't get more interest about the, the problem and about also what they are doing for the river. So the big question was um, how to make the problem for, of the river more visible and how to get the people involved. And then um, we, we make a, a meeting with different associations and groups of people that work or, or are really related to the river. For example, people that is, are selling things during the summer in the beach of Renaico River or people are, uh, for example, working for, for the for the boot, also for, um, como se dice, um, con los botes? With boats. Con los boats, yeah. Uh, and also some indigenous communities um, that have, of course, uh, another um, spirituality or cultural relation to the river. And, and then we talk about this idea uh, of a community museum. And they were really interesting, and, and of course, it was the idea to, to, to give the river a heritage uh, symbol, and in this case, a natural heritage. And, and then was the question how we are going to do the collection of the river. And, and then we discussed with the collective that uh, the best idea is to make all together different pieces for this museum. So then um, it was made a documentary film that uh, was made together with the collective, uh, with the collectivo of young people, because they already had an idea for a documentary film. It was uh, incredible because they have the script, they have already decided uh, how is going to participate and so on. And then I also propose some um, interventions, for example, with, uh, with bottles, with pet bottles. And I can, I don't know, do you think, uh, should I no, no, go. tell yes. now no, or go. later? No, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. In this case, for example, we work with um, organization of women 
a recycling organization and they collect these PET bottles that you find everywhere in Renaikon, also in the river. And then we have the idea to, to invite the people to write letters to the river. And of course, not to, to throw these bottles on the river, um, but to put the bottles hanging from the, from the bridge. So they, this uh, project was during two or three days. So the people could also take the bottles from, from the beach and they couldn't read it. And all of these, these activities uh, were documented on video. So at the end, the collection of, the, of the, this um, water museum, it is uh, videos and then also, so there's the documentary film and also this action that it was important to integrate children. So we invite uh, some schools and they make a kind of a human wave at the river as a metaphorical action uh, intended to return the water level of the river to, to its natural state. And this also we uh, documented on, on video. And we also invite the children to, to uh, draw, to make drawings. And the people um, donated a lot of old photographs. And we have a, a, a big collection of photographs. Um, and uh, still now they are um, collecting these pictures. And at the end, um, we wanted, of course, to show all of these pieces of the museum and to make it reality. But it was a, so it was a really big problem because we didn't find a place. And the municipality, um, yeah, they, we didn't have the support from them. Uh, we have a lot of problems with them also. Uh, for example, they wanted to see the, the documentary film first. That <laughs> Uh, first, that uh, before, uh, yeah, so before that we show it to the to the town, to the older community, mm -hmm. and yeah, and finally we decided to make it. Um, we are alone, and we 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 install the museum at at the river bank um, of the river, and uh, and yes, and. And it was during a long day uh, with a lot of also concerts, music concerts from local groups, bands, which of the pictures, uh, the old photograph, the picture from the children. And at the end, in the night, we show the films. And yes, this is a little bit the, yeah. the story of the community. Water Museum from Renaico. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Marcela. Uh, that yeah. would be like an input. And uh, Maria Teresa, uh, we would be very grateful if you could talk uh, with us a little bit more about the uh, Chico Valley Community Museum in Mexico City and the work that you have uh, developed along decades with the community, together with Genaro Amaro Altamirano, uh, the archaeologist of the community and who has been in charge also of researching and collecting materials. And you have uh, an, incredible, an incredible body of work related to the fight this community is leading uh, to prevent the museum to be closed by local authorities. Thank you so much for coming today, virtually at least. And I'm very happy that um, to see you all, although I am not there. Oh, thank you. Thank you and hi. Okay. Um, I started with um, the Hiko um, Museum by the Hiko Community Museum in 2009. Um, I arrived and saw the area and because I was interested in the phenomena of uh, the echo side of Lake oh. Chapel. It was done in the beginning of the 20th century, so quite recently, by a Spanish colonizer. And 
I saw the echo side and I was interested in working on this situation. Is it okay? So I asked the museum what I could do and they organized a meeting with the community. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So um, they organized a meeting with the community and at this meeting, they mandated me to tell their history. As an artist, that is not, not exactly what I was interested in doing. As an artist, I wanted to recreate a Chinampa because that area is the granary of Tenoch was the granary of Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico City as we know it, when it was the granary of Tenochtitlan before the Spanish invasion. Uh, it was feeding uh, 200,000 people that were in Tenochtitlan, the capital. This is before 1500. And so these were um, human-made islands uh, of indigenous engineering, started about 1400 before the common era. And they floated and they had all the agriculture on it. So the water uh, went into the island and self-irrigated. Brilliant, a very brilliant way of irrigation, no backbreaking work. And uh, when the Spanish colonizer um, destroyed the lake, he removed the water, all of these chinampas were destroyed. And therefore 23 towns and villages, their economies were destroyed along with all the fish, the birds that depended on it, insects, reptiles, etc. at that moment. Um, so I wanted to recreate a chinampa because you can see the carcasses of the chinampa in the land, in the environment. You can still see them. Somebody points them out, teaches you to look. You can then find them on your own. That's what I wanted to do. But the community wanted the history told. Um, so then I made work for Documenta, The Return of a Lake. And that is a, a large installation for me. Uh, it's a maquette of different parts of the area. And it's based on the aesthetics of the museum, uh, the community museum, because when you would come in, you would come into the museum and right on the entrance, uh, on the left, there would be a little maquette that they had made. And you began with a tour with a, gu a guide explaining the environment. And that's how you begin to look at art as the environment you are in. And um, I found that very important. So that's what the Return of a Lake was based on was that. Um, I then also um, made a book because it was requested. And I thought the community, a lot of the book is um, the different writings by me on the history of uh, Hiko, some translations of different uh, pamphlets that the mu community museum makes about the history, photocopied, you know, about 16, 12 pages. Um, I love that format very much because I myself have done that <laughs> when working on human rights issues in Brazil. Uh, you write it, reduce it to the tiniest print you can and then photocopy and fold it. Um, so that book was part that, part my own writings, um, a, a study by Raimundo Martinez, who was a Chauca whose grandparents were removed from the island of Hico, uh, which was on the lake of Chauco. And um, there was the regular edition. And I had asked, and I had always thought that the community would co-sign. I always, because it was co-authored work. And because of the political situation of Mexico, they um, did not want to do that. So, and interestingly, the book is now used as a history book in, uh, by progressive teachers in the community. Wow. And any problem that there exists is due to me, Maria Teresa, the historian. So mm. I think this is very important that communities teach us um, what is needed and how we respond, whether we are ready or not. <laughs> so I became a historian, though I was not ready, but um, that was the need of the time. And I thank them very much um, for uh, this lesson. And so I became the historian, but I also made uh, a special publication of the book. Uh, it was a special edition. The idea was to sell after paying the costs on it is just that the money made from the edition would go directly to the community museum. I am a very 
I'm a, I'm I'm good artist. I'm good at research, and I'm horrible at selling. So only one copy has been sold, and she has not paid the production cost yet. Uh, but hopefully one day this will change. But the reason that this uh, edition was made was because the community museum had told me that um, they had tried to contact the museum in Colombres, Asturias, which is the birthplace of the Spanish colonizer and where he is celebrated till this day. They celebrate the echo side. They said it was a great engineering feat um, in the 21st century. So that attitude of colonization continues. And they had wanted to make an exchange of publications between the two museums. And the museum in Asturias never replied to the community museum. And there's not um, many things we can do as artists uh, in the colonial situation, but there are things that we can do that are important things, sometimes very small things. Um, so I wanted the history of Hiko as they had requested in that um, archive in, Ast in Asturias. And I had gone there before and looked at the archive and there were a lot of books in leather and gold. And I said, okay, I will make 20 books in leather and gold and Amati paper. Amati paper is from the bark of a tree and the Catholic church considered this to be satanic, uh, the satanic. Uh, until the 1960s, from the 1500s to the 1960s, this fabrication of this paper was prohibited. And it was almost lost to technique and it was revived in the 1960s when you have the Catholic Church going into liberation theology. Um, so I also put in some Amate paper. And we had um, um, Hanero Amaro Altamirano, who is the co-founder of the museum, had been invited to Castle at my request because he was at that time under the threat of death by the, um, the area, by the police for being, uh, for preserving indigenous culture and working on saving the returning of a little bit of the lake. And for that, he was considered the most dangerous person in the Chaco region. And we're talking about a region that is uh, extremely poor and with uh, drug cartels and yet, the person that was of the extreme danger to the community was the co-founder of a community museum. So you can see the um, level of colonization in the Americas and the threat of indigenous culture and what it signifies that today you are a dangerous person just for preserving the artifacts, just for preserving the artifacts. So um, we went to the museum in, uh, Asturias and Hanaro gave the book. And we, um, this was very important for us to be able to do. And Teo wrote very well about that. And thank you uh, for understanding that that was very important in this long, long history. Um, then um, we, uh, I was able to have Hanaro also invited to give a talk in St. Martin's in London it's very difficult for traveling, the expenses, et cetera, but it's very important uh, that efforts be made, that community uh, museum people uh, be able to travel outside and speak about their own experiences. Mm -hmm. As that doesn't happen rare, uh, very much, I do take every opportunity to talk about this museum and I give half of my income from the speaker's fee to the community museum. Um, then in 19, uh, 2019, the museum was closed uh, by the municipality in a letter that was amazingly colonial. No explanation was given as to why it was closed. It was just closed. People protested. They had a banner that said, Denorio, uh, the archaeological objects are not yours. They belong to the people of Pueblo. And from this banner, I then uh, asked the community museum if I could reproduce it and translate it into languages in Europe. And I was giving a keynote speech in um, a, a cultural space in Leuven, Stuck, and I reproduced the banner in the same scale, more or less, in Spanish and in Flemish. And I asked the, uh, the people that were attending if they could come on stage and be photographed with it if they wanted to that it was an action. And then 
This photograph was sent to the community museum. And with this photograph for the first time, they were able to have national coverage on the closure of the museum. And then I repeated this performative action in Lisbon, in Basel, in Toronto and Vancouver. Um, then came the pandemic uh, and I, um, in lockdown of three months, and I started to learn how to make ceramics. And I was trying to figure out how am I gonna learn? I'm in Europe, but I don't wanna learn with European objects. And I had photographs of the collection of the community museum because I had been asked to photograph it. And I started to make the work in clay based on um, what I had in the photographs, which you can see behind Paz right now. Um, these are the uh, seven works I create, I made. And, um, and then I was thinking, well, maybe now with these seven works, which is works that are not available any longer to the community, the community collected over 5,000 artifacts. They began in 1996. Two truckloads of soldiers came to close the museum in 1996. They have had continuous problems since then. They're definitely closed in, in 2019. No access to the collection that the community made with no government support. And um, when they was closed, there were 12 police in front of the community museum, 12 in an area of high crime rate and, a drug, cart and drug cartels, 12 police to prevent the community from visiting the museum that they had made with their own money and efforts. Um, so these objects are no longer available to the community museum. I did the best I could. Um, there are many errors in them, uh, but I appreciate it very much the ability that these objects gave me to look at different ways of treating the body um, from uh, a, a different, a non-European perspective. So, um, I appreciate that. And the community museum wrote to ask if I could, if I could uh, put out information that the museum was closed. So I thought of this project, Son del Pueblo, of the people, where I asked people to please make uh, a ceramic object inspired by the community museum. If you go to my website and you go to Son del Pueblo of the people, you will find this, a PDF with all the collection. And if you can um, make an object, photograph it with, with you in the image, and then we put it in the museum website, in my website, and in the Instagram that we have made. Also during the pandemic, it's, it's very, um, I, I really, I, it was very important for me because it's very concentrated. Um, I started to make a poem in honor of the Graniceros, and I worked also with Senor Hanado. So we made a poem together about the Graniceros, who are the people who take care of water. Uh, they have been um, persecuted by the church since the 1500s. So now they uh, remain hidden in the caves. And um, we wrote a poem honoring their efforts to maintain the cycle of water, uh, even under continuous persecution of 500 years. And then um, I also wrote a book. I was asked by an uh, institution in um, in Rome uh, to do an artist book. And I thank you for scrolling through all the people that have participated very much, thank you. Uh, and I wrote a book and it was also to bring more visibility to the museum. And it's called Thieves and Murderers in Naples, a brief history on families, colonization, immense wealth, land theft, art, and the Valle de Rico Community Museum in Mexico. Uh, because I had discovered that um, a very, uh, aristocratic family in Naples, the Pignatellis, who have a museum called the Villa Pignatelli, uh, were connected to Cortez because uh, Cortez's fifth descendant in 1600 married somebody from the Pignatelli family. And so all that wealth transferred over to Italy. And uh, in the archives in Naples, which is 10 minutes away from where I am right now, um, I found a large document with all the tribute monies that were demanded of indigenous communities under Cortez. And under that list is Hico with their tribute money. 
and that money ended up in Naples. So I request the museum Pintatelli to offer a residency program for two to three people from the community museum and from the neighborhood of Rico to study the archives. So these are some of the works that I've been developing with the community museum. And um, yeah. Thank you very much, Maria Teresa. And um, I wonder if we could like go on talking a little bit more about like we understand community museums as, as those institutions that are like formed from the base, like from the social and cultural base of communities. Um, but this de definition has changed a long time since the middle of the, the second middle of uh, the 20th century until today. And we were uh, grownly confronted to other issues, for example, like immaterial heritage, social practices that have to be preserved in order for a community to survive or their way of life to survive. So maybe it would be interesting to, to see what you think about what kind of, what kind of practices and what kind of island, alliances with people do we have to make to keep museums alive or founding them, creating them with the community. And it's a very interesting question because as Maria Teresa said, we are approaching this problem from the perspective of the arts. Like we are imagining like new ways of generating institutions and entering into dialogue with them, uh, though we are not normally commissioned by society to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it's produced, or we are, we're commissioned by different sectors of society to do it, let's say. Maybe, Marcela, can you tell us, according to your experience, what, what is needed, or que es necesario, para crear y generar museos comunitarios? What is needed to create transform, develop, and preserve uh, museums as uh, places for the preservation of cultural memory and history. Para, uh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo se mantienen estos lugares de preservación de la cultura eh, y memoria histórica de una comunidad? Um, yeah, um, yes, thank you. Um, it's a big question. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, because uh, um, I think um, there are a lot of uh, organizations and, and group of people um, that are, um, how do you say, um, organized as, as a cultural groups and they develop a lot of things. But always, of course, is the problem of the support uh, from the government or from, from the municipalities, uh, because I think everything is there. Um, uh, I think um, you, uh, you find uh, a lot of these projects, these um, collective projects, and also I think is the self-organization, uh, self-organization, yes. Um, is also there, and also this self self finance, mm -hmm. also self sometimes, finance. Um, because the people learned like this um, uh, of because of this uh, big capitalism thing. Um, in the in the example of of Chile, um, you find uh, many activities that the people must to finance themselves like operations for, for someone. And for example, the people in Renaico, they, they make also self-finance uh, for cultural activities or for also to pay a lawyer in the case of the, of the problems with the river. So I think the problem is, ne is not the, um, um, the ideas, or, or the, 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 how do you say, las, las ganas, the lust? The, the intentions. The intentions the from, from the communities. The problem is the, yeah, that the, there is a lot of obstacles, I think, also. And it's, it's not, um, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I was thinking. Okay. A little bit more, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Marcela. And then, Julia, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about 
um, what do we need to do or in order to do to create and preserve community museums over time? What kind of alliances and practices do I mean, we I have to? I don't know. I can give an answer from my work because it's. I don't know if I can give an answer to this because it's not what, yeah. I'm also not a creator of this museum. Yeah. Uh, I collaborate with this museum. But what I find interesting in, in I mean, museums were created to legitimate uh, historical narrations, I would say. And, and these commun com community museums, they work at the op like the opposite. They, they are created to question the, the the narration that they is oppressing them, I will say, and, more, and, and I think they exist because there are people who want to resist. And we as, as artists, I mean, we have tools to, or, or in how I conceive my own practice is a way to narrate things. And, and I don't believe I'm going to change a reality, but I can like collaborate somehow in a way with these kind of constructions, which are built, being built up by communities, like the ones who were describing Maria Teresa and, and also uh, Marcela, and yeah. So, so yeah. But uh, it's interesting to see that we agree in the fact that these institutions are also formed um, in, in conditions, under conditions, in which resistance is necessary or yeah. uh, in order to hmm. reassert some kind of identity or new hmm. community, so. Maybe with I, with I can, like, because I didn't describe in, in the process I was doing, especially with the, shall I do it? And maybe this, this answer will come through the yeah. project itself. Okay. I think it will be easier. Um, uh, I will share, or oh, maybe you want to ask. Oh yeah, no, go, How, yes, yeah? no, you go. Uh, okay, wait a second. So I was saying before, do you see it now? No, sure, okay. <coughs> I was saying before that I was doing these portraits of, uh, on plates, uh, yeah, from people and, and plants and genetically modified plants and the collaborations we did with, uh, with the Museo del Hambre were actually two, mainly two. One was in the context of one biennial in Buenos Aires, which was called Malezas, Wits. So I, we organized together a, a meal, an agroecological meal, uh, but first a, a talk made by people I was doing the, the portraits before, and, and these portraits were shown in the exhibition itself and which I didn't say before that mainly like the whole project is about also writing, I would say, and, and, and I really like what you say, Teresa, before I wrote it here, I became an historian uh, in connection with my, my own experience because somehow, as I said before, I became a journalist. Like the people I was doing interviews, they didn't define me anymore as an artist, but they say, yeah, she's a writer, sometimes she's a journalist, they would say. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, and we did this talk uh, like during the last, not the government which is now in power in Argentina, but during the other government, Macri, uh, with, which was like a really particular experience because a few days after the director of the museum uh, was kicked up of the, of the institution. It was not a museum, but it's somehow like a cultural center which is like a museum. Um, I mean, not because of my, this talk, but because of many events. And, and it was really interesting to bring these people who were mainly talking in different contexts, uh, like more activist contexts, I will say, to be able to talk in an institutional museum which is belong to the national state, the same state which is writing all these laws and, and destroy the environment, like, uh, all the time. And, but, and so have to play with this institutionality, to be able to talk from inside of the master was somehow really important. And, and many, many people came, and afterwards we, we ate this creed that the workers of the museum made for everyone, 
And, and I, I projected the portraits of the people who I believe they are wits because they were, they were able to grow, uh, I would say, in this field also, like, like wits as, a, as, as resistant forces, let, let's say. And people were eating on plates where during an amount of time I was painting plants on these, or, or vegetables or fruits, I was eating during one year, let's say, and in the opposite, in the back side of the play, I wrote from, we, from which place these, uh, these uh, aliments uh -huh. were from. And it's important for me to say that, like, maybe now the scenario is changing and it's for sure much more different than in Europe, but uh, biological food in Argentina in 2017 was not an issue at all. I mean, we 70 percent of the food we eat in Argentina had poison. Mm -hmm. 70 percent of vegetables you eat is full of poison. Uh, like, and and to buy biological is uh, at that time was much more difficult. I was for sure not popular. So to to inst to to make that a nurse working on a hospital with children who are coming from from the fields which are. Uh, full of uh, pesticides to be able to talk there and to, to make that they are public, are able to listen this was for me an amazing thing I, and I was happy to also to do it with the Museum of Hunger because somehow all these people got to know through this talk about the Hunger Museum to be able to mix these publics was for me really important and, and also somehow to to these people who doesn't have anything to do with agroecology or these kind of, kind of environmental issues, to, to show that there are options. They are not only, they are not only supermans to, to buy food, let's say. And what I, what I was saying that, I, that people believe I'm journalist because I, what I, mainly the whole research is compressed on newspapers where I'm writing like chronics, like this one, I don't know if you, you can see my, like, something from there or no, I don't know. Um, and, like, and they are, oh, sorry, I, now I'm confusing the topics. I will exactly. come back to the second project we did with um, Hunger Museum, mm -hmm. which was about one small town in Buenos Aires province, which is called Guamini. Uh, which I got to know also in 2000, yeah, 2016, I guess. And they are a small group of farmers who decided to work with agroecology, but, but which is interesting is with extensive agroecology. Normally, people say that you can work with agroecology only like in, uh, in a small scale and also with uh, intensive, with vegetables. But the economical structure of Argentina is extensive agriculture, corn. Uh, and they are able, uh, somehow they, they, with the, the construction they were building, they were able to, to, to show and to prove that it's possible to, to change this kind of economical structure. Uh, I did this exhibition in the Hunger Museum, and afterwards I, I, did, I, I went back to Wamini to, to, to present my work there. The photos are from Wamini itself. And, and somehow the decision to work with Wamini was because we spoke with Marcos Filardi, with the lawyer, what, what, what kind of um, work I could present in the Hunger Museum. I wanted to make an exhibition with the, uh, there with another artist I'm working with, Aurelio Kopainik. Um, and we say there we didn't want to bring the problems, but the solutions. <laughs> we didn't show any, any, we didn't want to show inside of the Hunger Museum a portrait of the, the people applying this ecocide in the country, but the people bringing the alternatives and changing what is going on. Yeah. But I forgot your question. No, no it was just, <laughs> it was actually related to it in terms of, of the alliances and the connection you have with this institution, Museum of, of Hunger, and what kind of practices and what kind of co uh, connections do you need to make in order to, to, in your case, to cooperate for the preservation of the knowledges inside the institution. Yeah. And what was also really nice through the newspapers, which are for me the, the most important part of the whole project, 
it's like somehow people started to take them as a tool. Because I'm writing not as a scientist, not as a sociologist, I'm writing as an artist, as a food consumer, as a part of this uh, civil society with which the, the transgenic model is experimenting. And because it's a chronic, it's not a theoretical text, it's easy to read and it's nice to read because it's like reading a chronic, which is some, sometimes nice to do. And Marcos was yeah, giving to, yeah, the, to in me, lawyer meetings, the newspaper. The, the newspaper somehow, I, I lose the um, control of it. And yeah, I, I could say that the whole project somehow changed my practice in a way. Like, yeah, in this sense, like changing position and, yeah. And does it influence, it in, in a certain sense, your practice in Europe while you're based here? Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about it. Like, because before I was, yeah, working much more connecting with short money, with, because I was working about my family history in, in connection with communism and, and things which happened here during the GDR. And, yeah, somehow now I'm a bit much more concentrated in Argentina. And now that I'm coming back somehow, trying to work with the responsibilities of what is going on there, here, like Bayer Monsanto, and yeah. Bayer Monsanto and the main crop and agricultural chemicals producers in yeah, Germany exactly. and the US. Hmm. <laughs> and Maria Teresa, I wanted to ask you, as the constitution of, of this museum you, uh, of Chico Valley in Mexico City is, um, uh, let, uh, one could say that this museum is um, situated in a very difficult situation, which is the constant uh, fight for survival as a community and as a museum. So I would be very interested, you represented, uh, when you, you narrated very well the, the conflicts you had uh, at developing your collaboration with the institution there, and because the, the existence of the institution is being menaced, so I, I would also like to know like, which kind of alliances were essential to keep on fighting and working for, for the life of this museum of the Chico community. Can, uh, can I? Can you release your uh, Do I have to release? No, I already ah, yeah. I unmuted. Yeah, Sorry. OK, thank you. Constant problem we have with this. OK, um, we still still relate with ourselves very much bodily. <laughs> okay. um, I had done uh, a human rights work before. Um, in 1979, uh, I was a delegate of the International Indian Treaty Council, and I made a presentation at the United Nations Human Rights Committee of the time uh, against the Brazilian government. And I think it was the first time that there was one on human rights violations of Brazil. So um, I have, and I have worked, I worked for a while on the situation until um, I didn't think I could do, my efforts could not do anything. Uh, so one of the things I realized uh, with the community museum is Amnesty International has said, if someone is being threatened with death, you have to make them visible. You know? So one of the things that we can do uh, in our small networks that we have in Europe is uh, make people more visible. And one of the ways I did it was I invited um, artists that were coming down to Mexico. I said, please stop by the museum, uh, do some workshops because their European body or their European networks or their European connections would serve as a way of protecting someone else's body, who's a frontline uh, art activist. And um, that's why I wanted um, Janero Amaro Atomirano invited to Castle so that he would be publicly present in an interna international event uh, so that the authorities that be that were interested in repression would understand some situation. Uh, I also invited uh, other people in the arts, like curators, to come visit the museum and to be very obviously present there so that the public would know 
that there was this international situation happening. So um, there are situations that we as artists can, um, as we as uh, artists in Europe, mm -hmm. connected to different homelands in the Americas, we have networks that we think are not as useful as they could be to where we are, but they are uh, because how do was one say this gracefully, white bodies uh, count in um, the Americas, no? And so the white bodies that presented themselves in Leuven and Stuck got coverage, national coverage for the community museum. I didn't even think of it that way. I just was thinking of um, showing visible support, visible support to the community museum for courage when we all need courage. No? And that's why I did it. I didn't, I didn't have uh, a long-term idea about, oh, and then because we are white bodies, we will get, hmm. it just happened. And then I said, ah, this is a useful technique. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. different ways to approach situations and uh, we are learning all the time and we're having to uh, be in constant response to the needs of a community museum. And um, we have certain privileges in Europe and let's use them uh, in support of community museums to the specific needs that they might have. Thank you very much. So I, I was also interested that due to the fact that we're talking about life and life in Europe, which is a topic that you have touched and it's very interesting in terms also of this, this difference of bodies, we, are, we, we have the possibility being here, like being agents coming from our cultural and social backgrounds. In, in the case of Marcela Chile or yours in Argentina or Maria Teresa, the work developed in Brazil and Mexico from here. Um, how do we work with these levels of differences in our work? Because I assume, Marcela, that you also come as an agent from the outside, coming from, the, you, you are a possibility of help also for the community. And this is a role that is risky, in a, or a little bit dangerous in a certain way. But how do you manage to, to, to make this will to collaborate with the community effective in terms of an artwork and the research you're leading, which is politically engaged and productive in that sense too? Yeah, I think uh, a, a big thing, as an important thing, was that I was leaving there three months, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, of course, it's not so much time, but three months is a little bit time. And the the other thing is that um, the Renaico town is really small, so I could meet, I think, almost all the people. Um, so I have this routine to, to buy the bread, buy vegetables, and so I could talk with the people. And um, so, yes, of course, at, at the beginning, I was something like an um, uh, extranjero, uh, foreigner. a foreigner. But uh, later, I was more uh, also invited to eat with them and to, to participate in different activities. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know. I, I think uh, I, I, you have also, I think, this, this experience of the dista di distance mm -hmm. from, from your country. Yes. And, and it's also, I think, that is really good because uh, I'm not with all of this Chilean or uh, yeah, this Chilean conservative things that, that I see in my country. And um, I think you are in, in another dimension, I think. That is, I think it's really good, this distance. And um, in this way, I think it was, it was really easy for me to talk with the people. And it's also for me, uh, I, I could also understand uh, really good the social situation because I'm, I'm also coming from a, yeah, from a not so high social class and also my family come from, from the uh, countryside 
And the problems are actually really uh, similar to um, where I grew up. Uh, in, in San Fernando, this is a city close to Santiago, where at the moment also they have also a lot of problem with river. And yes. Because also um, Chile is one of the few countries in the world that has like a total privatization of water. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, that is a, a big problem. And now we have also hopes um, with this new constitution. And so I don't know. I think uh, it's important to also to have this distance with the country. I think it's, it could be a um, uh, fortile. Uh, an advantage. Advantage, yes. Yeah. Um. Um, and uh, in terms of alliances and collaborations, like what do you think is like one of the um, best experience you had with this Museum of Hunger? I mean, both are described before, I would say, and, and yeah, and also for me it was like a research center, I would say, and a meeting point, and, and, and maybe from a personal perspective, I can say how it was at the moment when, when the museum was created, Argentina was going to collapse. I mean, it's a disaster now still, and now more with the pandemic. But it was a really pessimistic moment because Macri was already a few years in power. People, I mean, everything was yeah, falling apart. I mean, the monoculture model was not invented by Macri. It was invented much before by Kirchner <laughs> or by Menem. But anyway, uh, but there was a place where you could breathe and you can you could have hope and, and you could build resistance. And this is a lot when, when everything is falling apart and you find a place where you can go every Friday and see there are people building alternatives. It's not a story. I mean, there are people constructing in this awful context things that could change the, the path that we have. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this, this, I would say, was the best experience I have yeah. there. And to eat with others, and also to reflect about what we are eating, because, like after this meal, every person will bring something. This I didn't say before about this. Uh, like each person was bringing something to share, and then Marcos was asking everyone what it is, who who did it, how, and then you have to start start to think, okay, which from where this this meal is coming from, where did I buy the meal, uh, I don't know, the flavor, or, <laughs> and somehow after the whole research, somehow in Argentina, I know the producers uh, which produce the food I'm eating there. So I went there, I, I know the farms, and, and this is something I, I earn, I will say, like mm -hmm. I, yeah, I changed my daily life, not only then be, because of the hunger museum, but in general because of the research itself. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are in, a, in an interesting situation here at the Museum of Democracy because we are like imagining a future without democracy. So, but it's a, a little bit a pessimistic approach, which is sometimes necessary in order to come to critical questions. So I would like ask you very freely, maybe to think together, what would be the future of these community museums? And what do we need in the future for community museums? I don't know which one of you would like um, to start. I don't know. Um, Maria Teresa? <laughs> we want to, I can't also see. Yeah, I, I was thinking uh, something uh, about the sovereignty <laughs> that you took. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, because... Um, I see, of course, uh, 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 this uh, change of paradigm that we have now, no? Yeah. In this uh, 21st century, yeah. and um, and I think uh, what the what the people uh, are um, fighting, also this sovereignty and also this independence, is the locality, no? The, the mm. to 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 have also their own cultural expressions. Yes. And um, I was uh, thinking of this really nice book of Maristela Svampa, yeah. that she talked about the territorios. Mm -hmm. 
So I have here something um, yeah. that say, she said, um, that territorios are space of resistance, but also are place of resignification and creation of new social and cultural relations. Yeah. So I think this is, this is, I think, the way you know, that we are looking for. Also, mm -hmm. a, a, a place where the people have independence uh, in the, in the um, uh, alimentation. Uh, nutritional independence. Uh, nutritional independence, and also economy independence, and also, also cultural independence. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the way where the community museums are, have a place, no? Yes. And the other things that uh, we talked before, it was about these concepts of UNESCO, yes. no? That we talk about this natural heritage or cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Because we, all, we also have this uh, question in Renaico about the river, of does it sign a natural heritage or a cultural heritage, no? And when you read it, it is a little bit uh, uh, lim limited, yeah, the concept, limited. no? Yeah. Uh, because for UNESCO, natural heritage is only something like beauty, yes. no? Mm -hmm. Something like that, really strange. So, <laughs> and, <laughs> and not cultural. Uh, and cultural is normally only uh, pieces of some uh, old uh, stuff, no? Mm. Old yeah. ceramics, but also, of course, some people. And I was, um, I found something really interesting that I found in Chile, actually. That is a new uh, form, also for UNESCO now. <laughs> that, uh, you, you talked uh, about that while we yeah. were preparing for this talk. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. And the name is, uh, wait, um, uh, Geoparks is the name. And now there is one in Chile. And I didn't know about it. This is a concept from 2001. And this is really interesting because um, they say, for example, uh, uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks has multiple aims, which included the protection and conservation of its territorial geo heritage and culturally and environmentally sustainable development of the area. Uh, UNESCO geoparks are fundamentally about people and about exploring and celebrating the links between our communities and the earth. So yeah. it's here you have an, 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 example. an example of uh, something a little bit better mm -hmm. to understand that nature is not this sacred space separated from human beings, mm -hmm. but in coexistence. Yes. No? So I think these thoughts uh, had a, a good inst instance uh, to change the per perceptions, maybe, or, or uh, I hope, no. So it is a kind of hope for me, for, for new institutions for, of yeah, the future for new, yes, of museums. For this, in this case, for community museums also, no? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah I, yeah, I don't know about community museums as a whole, but maybe in connection with the Museum of Democracy, it's nice to, to quote Marcos again, how he defined it or why he, he put this name to this museum. Marcos, the Marcos Filardi, commander. this lawyer, ah, Marcos. this, um, this okay. uh, lawyer especial, specialized in uh, human rights and food sovereignty who created this museum with others. Yes. Um, he says something like this, that he maintains that it is in our hands to lock hunger once and for all inside of a museum, so it remains there, confined forever. <laughs> and maybe, like we saw through all this year, that the democracy we have is not working, because this is not democracy what we have. So maybe we could confine this democracy in this museum <laughs> and start to imagine another kind of democracy, which function locally. We could like try to create units of good living, buen vivir, like to try to return to all this knowledge 
which you, Teresa, and also Maria Teresa, sorry, and uh, Marcela are, were also getting to know in the places you were working and with the people you were working with because they have these knowledges. We have to learn from them because they know how to produce food. Even if the system was trying to destroy them, these knowledge are still there. So we had to change the, the path. And maybe as artists, learning from them, we can bring this to the white European or white cities, not only European, because in Argentina, Buenos Aires people are also doesn't care about what is going on uh, on the countryside. And we can show a little bit of this knowledge that is already there and bring it to other contexts to change or change, to try to change the disaster we have. <laughs> yeah. Maybe this is the future of communal museums. Yeah. Units of Buen Vivir. Yeah. And Maria Teresa, could you tell us a little bit about the future of community museums as we have been working on them in the present? Yes, um, I never know about the future, but uh, <laughs> the community museum is closed and we continue to work outside of the public spaces and schools. So um, the future of the everyday there in the short term is very bleak. But I would like to think of, um, there is a list of principles that the community museum has. And I, would, um, I, I realize I should put this on my website. Um, and among the principles of the community museum is to participate in national issues and um, and solutions to social problems. That's the principle of a, among other ones, the community museum. And if uh, other museums, our local museums everywhere, uh, or not local museums, could adapt that as a as a practice, as a common practice, that be the base, the base where we then start other events, other participations of artists, etc. Um, that could be the beginning of a different way to look at museums. Um, and this is a, the a Valle Community Museum principle. Participate in national issues and solutions to social problems. And that, um, I think, is the future for a museum. Thank you very much. And I think we are, we are coming to an end now. We are coming to the 90 minutes we had programmed, and I'm very happy that we have like highlighted aspects of the works of this artist, Julia Mensch from Argentina, uh, based in Berlin, Marcela Moraga from Chile, based in Berlin as well, and our dear Maria Teresa Alves, who's now talking with us from Napoli in Italy. I thank you very much for coming to the Museum of Democracy, also virtually. And yes, I hope to see you soon in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much thank also. You. Thank you, Maria Teresa. Nice to thank you, Maria Teresa. Really nice <laughs> to meet you virtually. <laughs> thank uh, you very much. Yeah, thank you.